All aboard! Where's that going to be there? Oh, there's a ephemeral one. Next stop, oh. Chicago Junction! Well, welcome to the new year, and it is time for this month's edition of Chicago Junction, the program that takes you to the wonderful world of trains. And with the help of our panel of experts, and sometimes we have calling guests and visitors, I'm your announcer, Brian Ballou, and here is our boss, the head of the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network, our chief electrical engineer, Mr. John DeVita. Well, thank you very much, Brian, and Happy New Year, and welcome to another year of great broadcasting of Chicago Junction. And we are broadcasting from the John DeVita Broadcasting Center on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network on Wednesday, January the 8th, the year 2020. Today, the panel will be talking about railroads and model railroads. And now, to start today's broadcast, here's our announcer, Mr. Brian. Well, thank you, John. And now it's going to be time to meet the panel. First up is myself, Brian Ballou. I am a model railroader, uh, retired Navy uh, and uh, <laughs> real railroader. Um, belong to several clubs, uh, both historical societies and uh, model railroading clubs in G and O gauge. And to my right. Hi, this is Doug Kenyuk. I'm an end scaler, longtime rail fan, and officer in the railroad and short line clubs of Chicago. Good evening. My name is Kevin Berry. I'm a retired Chicago police sergeant, longtime Lionel collector and operator a director with the Chicagoland Lionel Railroad Club. And later on, we'll talk about the North Pole Express with the 1225 up in Owasso, Michigan. Hi, Dave Daruska, uh, former locomotive engineer, vice president of the Blackhawk chapter of the National Railway Historical Society. Uh, I run our Facebook page, Chicago Junction. And I am the uh, Chief muck Muckety Muck of uh, Chicago Railroad History Month. Is hey. there more to say? I don't know. I have. Uh, and, uh, and I'm glad uh, to be. We are so impressed. I'm, I'm glad to be part of this rendition of, <laughs> <laughs> of Chicago Junction. Oh, yes. We have been away because of uh, certain issues with our. With Mr. DeVita, but everything is. We have to get him rewired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and now, now he's the $50.50 50 uh, man. <laughs> Who's going to start off the fun tonight? <laughs> I have a. Listen, we're coming in, you know, got to get loosened up again. Well, I got some good stuff for you. Ooh, good stuff. Yeah, we like good stuff. <laughs> All oh, right. we, we ate. Okay, I'll get started then. Um, <laughs> St. Louis Streetcar Loop is currently shut down. It takes about uh, $240,000 a year to run it, and they ran out of money. And this is the one that cost $36 million to build. And right now the Bi-State Development Board is looking at taking it over, make it part of Metrolink. Uh, the main criticism of the line is it does absolutely nothing for transportation, it serves an area that has no attractions. Uh, so the trying to figure out how to fund it right now. And if they don't find a way to fund it or somebody takes it over, St. Louis County has to give back the federal funds used to build it. Oh, nice. Yeah. So they have a little bit of a problem down there. Uh, guess what? Toyota started this, but other shippers have jumped in, accusing the Class 1 railroads of price fixing. They said that they're basically operating in as a bunch of monopolies, and therefore the shippers can't get a good price. 
Well, we're, well there's only three, what, <laughs> yeah. three major railroads left. We're close to a monopoly. So, yeah, Toyota started this. They filed against NS and CSX. And now it's spread to the other railroads, and other shippers are now jumping in. Um, well, guess what? Our favorite EJ&E line's in trouble again. <laughs> Apparently the CN wants to double-track it from Spalding up to uh, past Elgin into Hoffman Estates. And the people saying, no, they, don't, they do not want that segment to be double-tracked. Uh, they give some strange reasons. The reasons they don't want the work to be done is lost vegetation, noise, vibration, and other environmental impacts. Yeah, nice. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Illinois is big on vegetation these days. So I don't understand the vibration one, but hey, you know. Um, so right now, the Army Corps of Engineers are looking into it. If I remember correctly, that used to be a double-track main line. Yes. Yes, the uh, outer circumference study in 1990 noted that the right-of-way is 100 feet wide, was double-track, and then the J took the one track out and moved the other one to the middle of the right-of-way. So that track's dead center right now. Yeah, because the C&W did the same thing <coughs> on the new line. Mm -hmm. So that was double-track all the way. And the, and the double track line they had to going up through Kenosha and to go into Milwaukee. That line, they cut into segments and made sightings out of the other and then downgraded uh, the speed to 30 mile an hour. Yeah, if you, if you go up to Racine and you look down the right of way, it looks like some crazy man just took a pen and just went. Yeah. Just, it just follows like wherever the track went. They just moved it over here, connected it here, moved it over here, connected it's just it's like the engineer was a, the, the the civil engineer was as sober as a judge. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to d differentiate the engineers. Yeah, none of us were sober. Well, the, the those, were, those were the fun days. Yeah, right. Uh, Durango and Silverton narrow gauge railroad it might be on the hook for twenty five mil. Uh, apparently, there was a fire a couple of years ago in that area, and it took the local authorities, cost them 25 mil to put out the forest fire, and they're blaming the railroad, saying that the coal sparks coming out of the steam engine set the forest on fire. The railroad says they're not liable because there's some, some kind of statute that was passed by the uh, government a long time ago that basically railroads can't be held liable for starting forest fires. And so the judge refused to throw out the lawsuit, so it looks like it's moving forward. Well, that's okay, because they also have done some investigating. They found out there were some fires set where the train wasn't running. Well, right now, uh, it's still in the court system. Them flying sparks. Got to watch out for them flying sparks. So... Yeah, you got to watch out for the greedy lawyers. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah it. the only people who make money on these deals. So maybe they're confused. Maybe the lawyer's name is Sparky. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know what you got on this, Dave, but the UP wants to bail. The Union Pacific wants to get out of running trains for Metro. Yes, they do. Are you going to talk more on it? I don't have anything about it, but uh, you got well, some. Well, basically, it's mm -hmm. purchase a service agreement and. And I guess Metro wants to get out of it, but uh, as Metro points out, it's not our tracks. <laughs> so they're, they're discussing that, so I'm not sure what's going to happen. There's a lawsuit involved in it, too, but they won't talk about what the basis of the lawsuit is. Yeah, and the current agreement expires at the end of February. Yeah, it's not going to not gonna affect the service, believe me. UP's not just going to say, okay, well, sorry, we're not running trains. No, I don't continue. I think no, they, 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 they tried that once, remember? Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> yeah, when the UP took over and they said, well, we're going to hold all these commuter trains for our freight traffic. <laughs> well, the speculation is, is that the metro trains are run by UP crews, not metro crews. Right. And well, they yeah. want the engineers, the crews for the freight trains, not for the metro trains. Right. And that's what the speculation is. Yeah, that and, and also the uh, the mechanical people, uh, people who, who work in the coach yard and the diesel shops. I mean, M19A doesn't serve, I don't think it services anything but commuter. So it may, occasional switch engine that works out at uh, Cal Ave. Yeah. But that, that's about it. So, you know, it's understandable. But I, I, I hate to tell them this, but 
they're going to have an awful lot of engineers want to flow over to the metro from UP. They don't want to work freight. Well, see, that's just it. It's not just what they want to do. What have they been doing with this getting into this precision railroading? Right. How many furloughs have there been from the other class ones? And what's going to happen with all them engineers that don't need, don't transfer over or uh, stay with UP? Oh, we have an overload of engineers now. Yeah. Didn't okay, start furloughing. Didn't the UP just close a yard someplace? Yeah. Yeah, Kansas City. Yeah. Yeah, they closed the yard and they filled it up with locomotives. Wonderful picture on uh, railpictures.net of just many, many UP locomotives just sitting there. Oh, here's the interesting news. There's going to be a high-speed maglev built between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. It's been held up because they have to, get this, provide an environmental impact statement for the tunneling they're doing under the river. But they expect to start construction uh, next year. They figure it's going to cost $12 billion. And who's funding this? FRA. <laughs> <laughs> they got two routes selected, and once they finish the environmental impact statement, they'll be ready to go. Okay, so what's the attraction of a line between Baltimore and Washington? Well, they expect to, after that's an operation, push it north to New York. Ah. But see, it'll go from Washington... Probably t- the, the, the 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 place would be uh, to the uh, Baltimore airport. That's where a lot of people go. I mean, that's one of the stops on the Accelerate. Okay. They, they they do not pass the airport stop. And and who's gonna run this wonderful high speed train? Eh? Didn't say. <laughs> Didn't say the engineering's being held up temporarily. <laughs> Well, they do. I, I'm trying to figure out why you need an environmental impact statement for a tunnel. Well, they might be tunneling under things, you know. Well, maybe. Now that's just the tunnel. And everything else is going to be elevated. Yeah. Yeah. Next to the parkway. Yes, it'll be elevated. So. <laughs> well, exactly. It, <laughs> you know, if if birds if birds can fly into windmills, they can fly into elevated trackage too. So, you know, we're going to have to have a big environmental impact on that those birds they just don't know where to fly anymore always running into things yep that's the california condors they put all those those big solar their wind generators up yeah and you get condor tartar (laughs) yep six thousand birds a year are being killed right now in that valley wow slice and dice yep and Sierra Club says it's not a problem. Did they? Yep. <laughs> they really did. They wimped out. Anyway, um, Congress has got a bill right now working its way through to ban all funded government-funded transit projects from buying Chinese-made rail cars and buses. That will take effect in two years once the bill is signed. However, once the bill is signed, it immediately bans the Washington Metro from buying anything. Because <laughs> they're, uh, apparently because of those crashes they had a couple of years back, they have to buy all new equipment. And right now the only company that's bidding on them happens to be the Chinese rail car company. <laughs> Nobody else bid on it. So. Yeah, because they've shut down all the Japanese ones. Yep. So it's, uh, now here's a story that's warm your just, heart. Just, to add on to what you're talking about, the Chinese companies, if you do business with China, in order to do business with them, you have to grant them access to all your intellectual material. And the reason given by Congress is that some of the companies involved also hold U.S. defense contracts and they're afraid that they can backdoor through the other programs into the defense work. All they got to do is talk to one of their aides. That's true, too. Yep. Okay, ready for this one? Yeah. 
Amtrak, you can't sue us if we crash. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, and this is up on your website, I had a good look, and yes, it's there. When you purchase a uh, uh, it says here, for those who generally disgruntled with Amtrak, have another reason for wishing the rail passenger carrier would change for the better or simply go away. The agreement with Amtrak that every passenger enters when they purchase a ticket now contains an arbitration clause that says essentially the passenger cannot sue the railroad for any quarrel they may have. <laughs> you have to go to arbitration. So it says the clause is broad and simple and includes simple matters up to and including wrongful death. So uh, that's because they put that in after the uh, the Philadelphia derailment, where they had uh, put out two hundred fifty six million dollars for wrongful death. They're so, still trying to get that bypass out west on the west coast opened up. The one where they had the big. Uh, accident with the talgo train up in washington yeah and then they refused to allow use of the talgo trains because they're now saying that they're not crash worthy <laughs> and and i'm sitting here going no no they are yeah right i mean if they weren't crash worthy they would have been a would have been a lot worse yeah it would have been shredded metal that's right and it wasn't shredded metal and i mean those of us who know you know, I I don't know much. Let's face it, but you know, some things cannot defy logic, no matter how hard you try. <laughs> it, well, the government does every day. That is true, <laughs> and that's all this is. You know, the uh, the state doesn't want to allow the use of the of the trackage because they're afraid it's you know they have to go through all these other studies and stuff to ensure its safety, and and. Well, what are you going to do? You know, the guy ran a speed restriction, for crying out loud. The guy, the engineer, was at fault. He was partially partially at fault. Amtrak also deserves some of the blame for the failure to properly train the people. They did not give them enough break-in time, and uh, this was the eventual outcome. Did he have a pilot with him on that trip? Yes. Okay. And wasn't that the pilot's responsibility to yes. jump in and do something? Yes. Yes. But they okay. were both poorly trained. Okay. You know, when the, I think they considered the pilot one trip more senior than this man who was operating the train. It was basically he was breaking in this guy, and he'd only been on the route once before. Oh, well, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that sounds like he was barely qualified uh, yeah. to sit in the chair, yeah, much right. less be a trainer. Right. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> now, here's for you engineers an interesting story. Uh, this was out of the November, uh, I think it's Rail Track and Ties or something like that magazine. Two months later, the Portland Bridge still crippled following a remote controlled train derailment. <laughs> Back in September of 2019, a uh, remote control uh, switching train on Swan Island up in Portland, Oregon derailed and damaged the bridge that goes over the island and they're still trying to figure out how to fix the bridge so i i know there's a lot of people who don't like remote control locomotives yeah. i see the signs all over the place now yes uh, i think the upper management thinks you're running a mile railroad great on a mile railroad not good in real life give a guy a belt pack and he's an engineer you know that's what's happening yes Here's an interesting concept. A company called Skyrights is going to grab the air rights over the railroads to use for drone deliveries. Their, this company has launched a new service aimed at encouraging the Class 1 railways to monetize their air rights above their tracks for drone delivery and urban air mobility applications. It's a real-life company. I looked them up. <laughs> they said the airspace over the railroads offer a safe and secure corridor to fly delivery drones compared with the routes above uh, populated areas. Well, they're going to be running in all those rail fan drones out there, too. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, found that as an interesting way of, you know, some companies going out and snapping up the air rates before the railroad lawyers, wait a minute, they're getting the money, not us. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, they got to pay for the air rights. It's not like they're just yep. going to grant them the, oh, yeah, you can use it. Go ahead. <laughs> so Cut into our business. We don't care. <laughs> well, it, it was bound to happen. Luckily, it's happening in another country. Uh, in time for the Olympics, China has opened the first automated high-speed rail line between two points. And now they have a second one in operation. So if it had to happen, it was coming. Yeah, I know. Well, what's the distance? Uh, the first one is 174 kilometers, and the second one's 53 kilometers. That's what, about uh, 102 miles, and the other one would be about... 100, 100 kilometers is 62 miles. Yeah. So it's right around 100 miles. Okay, so that's... And 53 would be about 50 miles? No. Uh, no. About 40 Try 20. Yeah. 25, 30. Because the labor pool in China is so tight. They can't find people to be engineers. So are, they, yeah. are they totally autonomous, or do they actually have somebody sitting up in the camera? Well, it's a China news release, so I'll take it for what it's worth. Oh, yeah. It's like that, it's like that bus that straddles the streets, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now here's one I think you're going to find interesting. You know how... In the summer, rails heat up and they'll kink and cause derailments. German Federal Railroad has come up with a solution to stop that. They're going to paint the rails white. And they're already doing it. They already have one kilometer done. They plan to roll it out to the rest of the system. Italy is following their lead and they're going to paint the rails white so they don't heat up and kink in the summer. Now, I'm assuming it's not the top of the rail because that paint would not last very long. No, they, they show the picture and paint the sides. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, he says, uh, says an environmentally friendly white paint in order to reflect the sun rays and reduce the overheating and rail deformation. <laughs> It's a long article. It gives you all the technical. They did measurements and which, stuff. Which minister's cousin got the contract? Yeah, right. How many times did you have to read it and try to keep a straight face? <laughs> About three times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was from a technology page. Uh, a company in Britain is going to start using facial recognition in order to balance crowding on the platforms when trains come in. Now, I'm not sure how they're going to work that, <laughs> but they're going to use facial recognition to count how many people and then tell the trains where to stop to pick up the crowds. <laughs> and I thought this country was the king of <laughs> Stupi unbelievability. Of stupidity? <laughs> On. Well, they would work fine if it were, they were automated trains. You know, yeah. they could send a signal to the train where to stop. But, you know, I, I work with engineers who took great pleasure in pulling long one day and pulling short the other day just to watch the passengers run down the platform. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like the old Bob Newhart routine about the CTA bus driver stopping to pick up the little old lady. And they, the, 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 the instructor tells the guy, Next time, let her get a step closer to the door before you close the door and pull <laughs> off. A <laughs> um, couple more items. A company called RailPod is selling an inspection unit that rides the rails and launches its own drones so that it can inspect the track without having a physical person there. So they use drones and a robotic vehicle to do track inspection. Yeah. This is an interesting article. It came up in one of the technology magazines. The railroads, I know you guys, quick on the uptake, has discovered that, you know, Amazon ships a lot of packages. How come they're not shipping by rail? <laughs> it's called the Amazon effect. And <laughs> what caught my eye was they said, Truck drivers are also ambassadors in that they see the shippers face to face every day and get to hear the complaints. Uh, shippers, they're trying to figure out how to get into the package business and get a slice of it. However, 
size matters. Second part of the article about shippers and small and labels and small shippers. And it said here, um, so if I'm a small shipper that needs a reliable and cost effective supplier, who do I approach to provide that service? <laughs> and definitely it's not the railroad according <laughs> to the article. Yeah, the UP would laugh you out the door. Yeah, any, he, any class one would laugh you out the door. Yeah, because he's... Well, well, see, it, one won't. There's one that still won't, and that's BNSF. Mm. They're, they, they're still not doing precision railroading. Yeah. Yeah, well, another phrase they, from the article is, unlike the trucking industry, the rail sector has been somewhat behind the curve when it comes to embracing innovation and change. With many large railroads more preoccupied with operating ratios than shippers, and that that makes sense. Yeah. Well, they're driving the business away left and right. Yeah. You know? If you if you look at the at their monthly, say for the last six months, they are losing freight every month. Yeah. Yep. And yes, here it is. The economy is riding high. Why are they losing? And it's what you're talking. They're going after the car load business, which well, you know, you know, there isn't. What was it? The last couple of months, there's been articles in the Rail Fan magazines. This is a box car. Yeah, right. It'll go to be in the museum. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, the railroads had the answer many years ago. It was called the Railway Express. Yes. yes. You know, it was door to door. They'd pick it up, they'd drop it off. Somebody just posted a. An ad from the Rock Island that that's they were touting their their ability to come to your door, pick up your packages, and deliver them. You know, they had it was all set up just like UPS and FedEx. They put it in a box car, especially special box car, put it on a freight train, and away it would go. And that's in, in fact, so freight houses were for. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, so now we have you know now now the trucks just travel across the country. And I, I don't know what's going on with the trucking industry either because they're they're going out of business. Who's who's moving all this stuff? You got these major trucking companies closing their doors, stranding their drivers, which are mostly contract drivers. They're not even employees. Hey, no answer for you on that. Yeah, one. it's really weird. Yeah, I know. I saw that posting from uh, my buddy Paul. Well, I think part, uh, well, part of it part of it is that despite the fact that the economy is quote unquote booming. Uh, the the uh, the trade wars have affected a lot of a lot of shipping. You know, less stuff is being shipped. Okay, and I got some regular railroad news. What? A a railroad downstate called Decatur in eastern Illinois, which took over some of the old New York Central lines, is acquiring the Eastern Illinois Railroad. That's a fifty three mile short line downstate. Just interesting news. Here's one probably nobody heard of, the C&C Railroad, that's capital C and C, owned by Center Point Properties down uh, right off of Global One, down on North Lake. Uh, they got into a fight with the Union Pacific. Now, this railroad was formed 15 years ago by Center Point to serve their warehouses. Never once, no shipments, nothing's ever run on their rails. So the UP came along and took the switch out. <laughs> Centerpoint discovered that and complained, put the switch back, and the UP says, you got no business. Nothing's run over these things in 15 years. And they said, it's not the point. We wanted a real connection. They said, I'm not sure what the settlement is yet because it hasn't been published. This wasn't part of the Iowa Pacific Empire, was no. it? Since these Centerpoint properties, they own all these big warehouses okay, in there. Okay, okay. Um, Sioux Line and... Uh, well, Canadian Pacific and Canadian National actually got into a fight where to interchange cars in Chicago. So they used to interchange at Spalding. They now interchange by delivering the stuff to BRC at Clearing. That was fine. That was the settlement. Now they're arguing over who pays for the, who pays the BRC fees. <laughs> <laughs> for you know, changing the cars and clearing. <laughs> I 
You can't make this stuff no, up. No, well, that's because the railroads are run by bean counters and venture capitalists. They aren't run by railroaders. And finally, your favorite, Dave, the Illinois Tollway and the Sioux Line <laughs> have extended negotiations to March 16th of this year. They're still negotiating. I had to go look it up. They started this all back in November of 2016. And they're still negotiating over that piece of land that's along Green Street between York and the Toy. You know, California may have their high-speed rail built before that's ever settled. <laughs> <laughs> and that wraps up the humorous yeah, part of the the show. Doug News. <laughs> okay. Hey, Mr. Kevin. Mr. Kevin's Mr. got some Kevin. good stuff. Uh, Menards has once again come forward with a new product, uh, one that is contemporary to both today and the rail uh, model railroading hobby. They took a warehouse building and painted it a wonderful shade of pumpkin orange and put some black stripes on it and put up the Schneider transportation logo at the two short ends and you can also buy the TTX cars and Schneider container boxes and set up your own little uh, Schneider subline station or whatever you want to call it it comes with a uh, Forklift with a pallet on it, a couple, a couple of other pallets, uh, the ever popular Jack the Dog. I was wondering. I was waiting yeah. for that. Uncle Brian's favorite beastie, <laughs> and uh, they're rolling it out at a hundred dollars, ninety nine, ninety nine. It's pre lit, pre built, has forty five lights, and an animated forklift, Ooh. and. Uh, it's a really good-looking model. This is an upgrade from their other buildings because this this one has the the animated forklift that that moves around on it, uh, and it's got lights too. Ooh. It's 14 inches by 11 and one half inches, and it's five and three quarters inch tall. And the last line of the description said, "Jack the German Shepherd is keeping an eye on one loading dock." So we know at least somebody on the premise is working. <laughs> uh, in the most recent issue of the WTTW The Guide, on page three, uh, Jeffrey Bear, everybody's favorite guide about Chicago. Maybe yours. Has a new... Uh, series of shows coming out entitled Chicago by L and uh, on the Thursday the 20th of February he will be doing two presentations up at WTTW Studios at 5400 North St. Louis and he will be accompanied by several gentlemen in period correct CTA conductor uniforms and he'll do a preview showing of, of this doc, documentary that he did. And if that is something that interests you, you need to contact WTTW and purchase tickets. The showings will be at 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, since last we met, two things of interest happened. One is I made the Hodge up to Owasso, Michigan, with every intention of making the North Pole Express behind the 1225, but the uh, beautiful beastie was down with mechanical problems, so they put a couple of diesels into service, but it was a very enjoyable trip. They uh, went about 20 miles down the, down the line to Ashley, Michigan, where the town folk had turned the main drag into North Pole City with all kinds of shops and places to get something to eat and uh, things to spend your hard-earned money on. 
And the last event before everybody got back on the train was Santa presenting the first gift of Christmas. Uh, and some lucky 12-year-old girl got the first gift of Christmas. And then we all climbed back on the train and made the Hodge back to Owasso. And then on December 9th, the historic Pullman Foundation had their 2019 Candlelight House Walk. And in what used to be the Masonic Hall and is now called the Florence Loudon Miller Historic Pullman Center was trains of most descriptions. There were two 12-foot by 8-foot O-gauge train layouts. Uh, there was an HO Budweiser train, which I'm sure would bring smiles to a couple of people's hearts. And there was a gentleman had a double oval of N-scale trains, and he had managed to craft uh, several Pullman-type buildings, including the, the clock tower. Uh, there were 160 people who went through that one building just to see the trains. Uh, the, the one millionth Pullman boxcar in, in O-scale was on display. Uh, I had a train running with Pullman troop sleeper cars, and as one of the train operators pointed out, all 2,200 of the actual Pullman troop sleeper cars were built at the Pullman Chicago plant, and uh, the M1000 that made its premiere at the 1933 Chicago World's Fair was also running in O scale. So, you know, there was a nice Chicago Pullman display going. And uh, that's about all I have for the moment. I have a question uh, for the Jaffrey Bear presentation with these uh, people in period costumes. Will they make uh, unintelligible announcements throughout the program? There is a... There is a quote that during this lively event, Jeffrey, Eddie, and CTA historians in vintage uniforms will answer questions about the L in Chicago, and you'll meet a surprise guest whose voice you'll recognize if you ride the L regular. Oh, it's Mr. Bing Bong. Bing Bong. It may be the gentleman who was in uh, The Fugitive. Or at least his voice was in the fugitive. Mm. When they, when they, the one scene where uh, they identified where he was when, when Harrison Ford was on the phone with uh, the lead, the lead FBI agent uh, Gerard. Gerard, yeah, I'm trying to think of his actual name. Tommy and Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones, and in the background, he hears the train announcing for the merchandise mart. Right. That, well, they're at Van Buren Street. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the in the background, you see the train about to cross over the river. Okay. Uh, that was filmed close to St. Patrick's Day, because when Tommy Lee Jones runs across the street, that epically tall, kilted. Pipe ma or drum major with the uh, mace in his hand was the pipe major from the Emerald Society. And I did march in that parade. Fortunately, I wasn't on film, so I wasn't sued for causing anyone blindness. Should we, should we greet our, our latest uh, addition to our, our would our panel? mystery guests sign in please next stop Balboa station <laughs> <laughs> good afternoon gentlemen good afternoon Ron how was your holiday very good very good and you sent us some such amusing stories I think that I, I don't know so I try to just send some no, stuff that's I interesting mean, it, you know. it is well it's just like some of the stuff he's saying, you know, yeah. you can't 
the truth is stranger than anything else. Yeah, that's true. And when you can get photographic proof of it. <laughs> I, th- I actually think I have one of the things that you sent about uh, the, uh, the drunken uh, train drivers in Melbourne. Is that from you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> train services had to be canceled and delayed in Melbourne after drivers ate a treat that may have contained alcohol at their Christmas party. Rum balls. Eight staff were sent home after eating rum balls over fears they may have pushed them over the limit, the Herald Sun reported. Yara trams drivers have to have a blood alcohol level of 0.00 to work. The food was served at a lunch for staff working on Christmas Day. Bosses weren't sure if the rum balls contained <laughs> alcohol, but sent the eight workers home as a precaution, and I'm sure they loved every minute of it. <laughs> Yara Trams removed eight drivers from service on Christmas Day after they ate a dessert, which may have contained alcohol, a spokesman said. Keep going. Dave. There you go. <laughs> That okay. is good. Okay, real real news here. Service Transportation Board has named member Martin Oberman, the agency's vice chairman. Oberman succeeds Patrick Fuchs, who continues to serve as a board member, SDB official said in a January 6th press release. A Chicago attorney, Oberman, Oberman was sworn in as an STB member on January 22nd of 2019. He has an extensive career in the public and private sectors, including service as a Chicago alderman, a member of Metro's board, and recently a member of the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. Uh, Since 1975, Oberman Oberman has maintained a practice in Chicago as a trial and appellate lawyer. So that's that's, that's that. Oh, and and, uh, Kevin and I were talking about this on the way over here. Oh, who was our, our, the former chairman of Metro? Uh, Baga? No, after him. The guy that just retired. Oh, Orsino. Orsino, yeah. Don Orsino has been appointed by Will County as a member of the Metro Board. <laughs> so the Metro Board uh, gave him a pay increase so he'd get a, a higher pension. They painted a locomotive and named it after him, and now he's a board member of Metro. Stands to reason, doesn't it? Of course. He this knows is Northeast the Illinois at its best. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> uh, a project to connect Chicago to the Quad Cities via an Amtrak route has secured an extension until the end of 2024 for federal funding originally awarded under the Obama administration. Senators Dick Durbin and Tammy Duckworth and uh, Representative Sherry Bustos wrote two letters to the U.S. Department of Transportation urging an extension to the $177 million in funds awarded in the physical year of 2010 through the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, elected officials cited delays in the project brought on by Illinois' previous governor, who will go unnamed, and <laughs> <laughs> whose name shall not be mentioned, I think it was Voldemort, <laughs> and positive movement in negotiations regarding the scope of the project as reasons to support the extension. So uh, it would this funding would be awarded to IDOT, Illinois Department of Transportation, to begin twice daily round service between Chicago and the Quad Cities, with intermediate stops at Geneseo, Princeton, Mendota, and Plano, Illinois. And there's a whole lot more about it, but we're not going to go into that. Uh, the last passenger trains rolled into Peoria train station in the early 1980s, but there is a way to link the River City's residents to the rails once again. Joe Schwederman of the Chaddock Institute for Metropolitan Development at DePaul University says Amtrak throughway bus connections could make rail transit more seamless. Got that now? Buses. <laughs> buses will make rail transit seamless. Are those buses going to be court ordered? <laughs> I don't know. Buses? School buses. We maybe. don't need no stinking buses. <laughs> right. Uh, you look at s- other states like Wisconsin, there are five-minute connections in Milwaukee for people going to Green Bay. So you hop off the train, and the bus is right there, and you go, he said. This is Mr. Schwederman. And our state isn't quite at that level yet. We think that c- could be a way to really close the gap and really give Peoria better links without too much capital outlight. 
But, Schwederman said, Illinois hasn't historically supported inner city bus service. Oh, there's the rub. Rochelle, infrastructure for a huge rail expansion project that could open up 1,000 acres of land for industrial development in Lee County will be completed by the end of January. The city of Rochelle and the Greater Rochelle Economic Development Corporation started building its own rail system in 1986. The city has been working with the Lee County Industrial Development Association on the Rail Industrial Park, which would become one of the largest in Illinois. The vision for the project became much larger this year when Union Pacific Railroad announced plans to close its intermodal ramp operations in Rochelle. <laughs> This is now a $25 million project which has significant economic implications for Rochelle and Lee County. The city will annex the land, but it is in the Lee Ogle, Lee Ogle Enterprise Zone, which will provide rail service for the entire area. The project includes a 3.5-mile rail extension, a multi-track rail bridge over Johns Creek, and a loading yard equipped with multiple modes of transportation. The rail yard will be able to handle up to 150,000 intermodal containers annually, adding about 4,000 feet of rail to the city switchyard will open up more than more development east towards Interstate 39. And I don't think anybody's asked the people in Rochelle what they think of this. I doubt if they're very happy about it. So after 33 years, they're almost ready? <laughs> well, you know, you people out of there for a reason. Oh, you, well, remember, they said, well, we don't, you know, they're trying to consolidate everything. That's one of the reasons why they closed that one down. Yeah. Because, oh, we'll, we'll keep the one that's in the crowded area downtown. Well, you know, we'll see where that goes because they, they seem to have this, you know, bright vision of, of a future where there's going to be all this industry out there. And, you know, I don't see that happening anytime soon. The Wall Street Journal reported that rail car assets have become a headache. For banks as the industry continues to suffer. According to the journal, rail car assets once delivered steady revenue, but now have become a hassle as leasing rates have plummeted, leaving the banks responsible for maintenance costs. One appraiser told the journal that this is the worst market he has witnessed in more than 30 years of the rail car industry. And let's see. And that's in a booming economy. What are they going to do when things go south? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, Governor Eric Holcomb of Indiana uh, isn't ready to say who he plans to report to the board that oversees the South Shore Line when two of his original members leave their post at the end of the year. The Republican chief executive said in an exclusive interview with the uh, Indiana Times that he expects to announce a new board member for the Northern Indiana Commuter Transportation District of Trustees, boy that's a mouthful, in the first month of the new year. Uh, Let's see. The originally, it was an 11 board member, a uh, locally appointed board. It was made in conjunction with the $205 million state investment in the South, South Shore's West Lake expansion and the plan to speed commutes to Chicago on the existing rail line by adding a second track between Gary and Michigan City. Uh, and then uh, the state stepped in and basically reduced the number of board members and essentially took over. So there's no more local input for the most part. Anyway, so that's that's my news Hi. from the wonderful hey. world of railroading. Well, they must be getting their training from Noblesville. We can do anything we want. <laughs> yeah, because Noblesville, you know, the, it was funny because last year they, they ran the fare train. Yeah. And they had a group doing it, and then suddenly the... Uh, Mayor came and says, oh, okay, we got somebody that's going to buy the track and take it up. So now they're going to take out 12 miles of track. Don't know about the north end, though. <laughs> Did that sale ever go through? Yeah. They're going to remove 12 miles of track. They're going to put their, uh, their hike bike trail in. That's going to make a lot of money. Yeah, right. You're going to be able to set your hot dog stand up right next to that trail. Not only that, but the environmental impact statement said that uh, hikers don't do as much damage as the trains do. No. no. For <laughs> real. Really, really? Yes. On the topic of hiking trails, just as I walked out of my house to come up here tonight, the 606 trail was on the news again. 
Mayor Lightfoot is uh, up in arms because of the gentrification forcing the folks that were th- were there before the 606 was transitioned from a rail line an abandoned rail line yeah to to the the 606 trail and she's going to be introducing a new ordinance in city hall or at city council to you know that will guarantee that it won't happen if other sections of abandoned trackage are converted into into yuppie trails. Well, you know what th- this is about. It's about the one in, in uh, Pilsen, the Paseo Trail, the old uh, IM line there. Yeah, Illinois Northern. IN, yeah, right, Illinois yeah. Northern, right. Uh, there are plans to uh, turn that into a trail, and the locals are not pleased about that because they see what's going on on the north side, and they realize that they're going to get pushed out. Well, they're already getting pushed out. I mean, ever since the U of I expanded and got rid of uh, Maxwell Street, the development's been moving south. And uh, Bridgeport's moving north, so it's only a matter of time. And then there was another Pensy line on the south side that uh, is being eyed for a trail. It was a Pensy connecting line, I think. Oh, the... In Englewood. Okay. Oh, yeah, the old Englewood connecting line that yeah. connected the two Penzi projects, yeah. uh, two Penzi lines. Yeah, there have been talk, there's been talk, and this is actually a, a community uh, pushed effort to try to duplicate what's going on on the north side. You know, hopefully they want to see uh, property values increase. Well, they took the, the old Penzi track that crossed 127th Street near Parnell, and that's the, you know, track's all gone. That's the Major Taylor Trail. Yeah, Major Taylor Trail. Ma- and it runs between uh, the Dan Ryan Woods and Whistler Woods. I've ridden it on a bike. It's not contiguous, though. There's a point where the track, it, where the trail is broken, and you have to use city streets, and if you're brave enough, you can go down Vincennes. Or if you're crazy enough. That's what I was going to say. It, it, it's, I, I, I prefer using the side streets to get there. I tried Vincennes once, and I was like, uh, (laughs) how do I get off of this? But, yeah, the Major Trailer Trail, was it's old. It's been around for a long time. Yeah, they they put a speed camera on 127th Street rather close to where the Major Taylor Trail is. Yeah. And uh, the city's getting fat. You know, it, it's a, it's there because, quote unquote, there is a park nearby. Yeah. Well, the closest park is West Pullman Park on 123rd Street. Has to, I looked this all up. It has to be within a mile. The speed cam has to be within a mile of a park. We have the same problem on the north side. You come down southbound on uh, northbound on Cicero after leaving Montre- uh, Lawrence Avenue going towards Elston and after you come out from underneath the old Northwestern Bridge there's a speed camera okay where's the park well the park is just off of Ainsley it's not even a park it's one of those little lot parks play lots, play lots yeah and there's one there's one on Belmont Avenue right by Cicero same thing there's this tiny half lot park about the size of my backyard but it's a Chicago park parked like 694 or something and that's what the speed camera is protecting <laughs> okay and there's another speed camera on Forest Preserve Drive just west of Addison Street by uh, Our Lady of uh, that the Catholic Church that's over there and there's a play lot right across the street because when I used to take Oscar to work uh, over at Pioneer Powder, I used to pass by there, and I saw that speed camera right there. Uh, uh, by, it's right just before <coughs> you get to the church. It's on Forest Preserve Drive, just west of Addison yeah, Street. The and there's one on Addison is that, is that right there. Our Lady of the Unfair Ticket. Yeah. <laughs> our, our Lady, Our Lady of Sandbag. <laughs> okay, Brian. What else you got? Yeah. Well, let's see. Your turn. No. Well, in the world of preservation. Uh, things are going along real well in Cleveland. 
with the uh, Reading 2100. Uh, they're doing the final final works, boilers all to p put together and everything, and they're basically getting the other parts and putting them back in. They got pictures to follow. Um, and so they're looking at uh, midsummer uh, fire up. Uh, 1225 is back in service. The crew was, we did it the 23rd. The crew, the repair crew was due there on the 25th, and it was supposed to be back in service for the 30th. Uh, they would not tell me what was wrong with the engine. I was told a steam tube blew. Superheater tube. I talked to the mechanic. And then, uh, and right now they're uh, trying to raise funds to move uh, Texas, uh, BNLE, Texas engine uh, that was owned by Glenn Campbell. That's Glenn with two ends. And he, that's the way he introduced himself in Pittsburgh. But he had it in the, in the Greenwood uh, Roundhouse. And what they're going to do is, is get the funds together so they can, uh, they've got it stripped down to the weight. They still have to take the boiler off, and they're going to ship both the running gear and boiler on different flatbeds hmm. to keep the weight down because they couldn't take it by rail because the old Ohio Central track wouldn't hold it, hmm. would spread to a few of it. Um, and those that are out there I'm, uh, are probably a lot of people are waiting for the uh, movies of the big boy, 4014, doing the Southwest uh, South tour. And I would actually want to buy that one because I want to see probably the last five minutes of it are going to be the best film with it going through the snow through uh, Kansas into Colorado. I saw they actually showed it on Good Morning America about the storm that moved through. And they showed the engine. They didn't say what it was. All they said, they had this antique train going through, <laughs> making like the Polar Express. <laughs> exactly what they said. I'm sitting there going, not that the largest steam locomotive in the world's going through. And, and I said, look, I said, I know some people probably got some really good snow going shots with that though and speaking of snow actually there were some good shots in uh, first and fastest the uh magazine from the uh interurban yeah group they had some nice pictures of the oh. snow yeah the fact that good morning america got it that close to being right <laughs> is shocking <laughs> of and by itself <laughs> but yeah the uh i think the biggest uh, shocker of the news is san bernardino shut down I-15 was literally snowed down, the first time ever. Snow shut down Cajon Pass. Uh, Ain't nothing worse than chilly I mean, you, Cajons. You, oh, yeah. I mean, you couldn't get out of Vegas. <laughs> Vegas, the uh, road to, uh, to Barstow, got shut, shut down. Get, uh, all the way through Cajon Pass to San Bernardino. 15 was shut down for like two days while they were trying to get going up there. Yeah, and I said, I really wanted to be there to see that. Was the Donner family choir performing? <laughs> You're a little far too far south. <laughs> You're a little too far south. But it looks like it's going to be a good year for... Uh, in a lot of tourist groups with uh, the steam, uh, Blue Mountain and Redding will have the 2102 uh, running. Uh, Big Boy is in the uh, Steamtown shops. It's going to be uh, at the Steamtown uh, Museum there in Scranton. And she's going to be all cosmetically restored and put out there. They're slowly getting it back. They actually have a gentleman that's going to stay more than nine months. <laughs> from the park service to be in charge he's actually going to be there for like five years oh, wow. are we t are we talking about 
the big boy that was just on tour, or are we talking about one of the big boys that's already at... S- We're talking about a big boy that's on display okay. in Scranton, Pennsylvania at Steamtown. It's being cosmetically restored. See, a lot of the engines have been let to yes. be a little weather-worn. Oh, uh, well, you're being extremely kind. Yes. I, I, was, I was there about 10 years ago, and uh, the people that allowed the engines there to get into the condition that they were in would have would have said thank you if they were just put up against the wall and buggy whipped. <laughs> but anyway, slowly the engines are all coming back cosmetically. Some of the engines are being rebuilt. Oh, they uh, got a beautiful back shop there. Yeah, well, they're actually going to have people in there that could use it. I found out one of the vocational schools is going to start hold, be, holding classes near teaching machining and such. Cool. Yeah. Uh, that that's a good good thing. And, and and the T1 people have fabricated another screw for their locomotive. <laughs> <laughs> what do they have so far now? A cab. Yeah. And that's it, right? Yep. They have a cab, and that's it. <laughs> So do they take turns sitting in it, pretending they're sitting behind a T1? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, it's, it's funny. They're talking about how much money they want to raise and how much money they got, but they're not really moving real fast. They're finally getting all the drivers, um, but they're still working on the frame. That was a, They've was got that the a, nose. Was that a cast frame or was yeah, it was a cast frame, but what they're going to be doing, they're, they're going to piece it together. Okay. You know, get that laser, plasma laser out there. I saw them building a ship on TV the other day in sections, and it was like, wow, you know. Well, you know, we can thank, uh, actually, Kaiser for that. He, he, when he, he came up doing the same method like Ford... On an assembly line, mm-hmm. and that uh, they, you know, they, that's how they made the jeep carriers in World War Two. They made them in modules. The uh, the Gerald Ford was a modular yeah. design and build. And uh, later this year, when they they get serious about the John Kennedy, it'll be the same way. <coughs> well, of course. I mean, yeah, look, but see. In World War II, it was a unique concept to build it modular. Yeah, I, I agree. And that's how those carrier, you know, those small carriers got built. You know, Guadalcanal. I mean, they made what fifty-two of them. It, anyway, up, so let's up. go back to trains. Yeah. Okay, hey, Ron. Hello. Got anything to add to the? To the mix? I was just going to ask, is, is the big boy scheduled at any time to return to this area? No. Um, I do know they're going to be doing a Northwest tour. They're going to be planning that. Um, so I might have to come through here to get there? Unfortunately. Well, maybe they might come back and do it. But uh, we'll see how far in the Northeast they go, because they did hit Montana when they went up from Mogden. When they did it, uh, their Midwest tour. LCCA is having their convention in Omaha this year, and the big boy is not on the schedule of events. Unless something you, changes. You go to Kefenic Park. It's sitting up on the hill. <laughs> no, I want to see a real, real fire breathing big boy. Well, then go to Cheyenne. Like I said at one of the earlier programs, when it was here and sitting in Elmhurst or wherever it was over there, where it was oh, in West, West Chicago, West Chicago. Yeah. I did not go there. I did not want to see it standing because I can go to IRM or go to any museum to see one standing and not doing anything. Well, I saw it standing, and then on Monday I went there, yes, and or Tuesday I went there, and yes, I w- drove down the tracks. I wanted to see it come by and get a good... That's what picture I did. of it moving. That's what I did. And that's 
Yes, that's the way to see it properly. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, that's the guy that didn't invite any of us to take a ride with him when he got a ride on that train. He who? I didn't know at the time. Uh -huh. You got a ride. <laughs> I got a ride. Not a cab ride. No. No. I was in a baggage car. <laughs> <laughs> Appropriately. Yeah, they had me tied up there, you know. Put, hang, had me hanging like a mailbag. Excess baggage. <laughs> <laughs> Why, why am I envisioning the scene with the Three Stooges and the gorilla? <laughs> well, that's going to be the Marx as Brothers, too. As yeah, long sure. as you don't envision the scene with the gorilla from Trading Places. Ooh. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Uh, are we going to put a cork in this? I guess we should. But uh, yeah, bank the fires, clean the ashes. Yeah, we yeah we got to clean the grates. Turn that water on in the firebox so we can in the ash pan, <laughs> so we don't burn the tracks. Don't want that city to sue us. But they should be having an oil burner uh, there. They've been working on that, so one of the four hundreds will be converted. Anyway. I believe it's time for us to say adieu. As our express comes into the terminal, we want to thank you for joining us on our journey through the wonderful world of trains. Chicago Junction is a production of the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network and can be seen on the web at www.windycityhometown.com where you can listen to tonight's broadcast and all of our past episodes. You can also sample some of the other fine programs that are being offered. Till next month, as we, say, as we journey to Chicago Junction, I'm your announcer, Brian Blue, saying happy rails to you and good night, Mr. Ryan, wherever you are. You've been listening to Chicago Junction on the Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network from the John DeVita Broadcast Center on Wednesday, January the 8th, year 2020. Chicago Junction was produced and directed by John DeVita, and our special thanks to the executive producer of Windy City Hometown Entertainment Network, Mr. John Chaconda. This broadcast was pre-recorded on Wednesday, January the 20th, uh, January the 8th, the year 2020. Until next time, be safe and thanks for listening. Happy New Year to all, all our great listeners. <laughs>